Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for that introduction. My name is Tyson, and thanks for having me here today. Um, like many of you, I have several hobbies. Um, I like to run, I like to play music, and I also like to solve the Rubik's Cube. With all of my hobbies, I've noticed that two people can spend roughly the same amount of time and effort learning something or working on something, and they can achieve very different results. I first learned to solve the Rubik's Cube in 2003, about 10 years ago, and since then, I've had the opportunity to teach many people. Over time, uh, my methods for teaching the Rubik's Cube have evolved, but the amount of time it takes someone to learn to solve the Rubik's Cube is pretty consistent, about two hours. Uh, when I teach someone to solve the Rubik's Cube, they can generally solve the puzzle in about two minutes. But I've seen many students, at no fault of their own, struggle to improve past five minutes, simply because of the way they learned. If, you know, it makes sense that if the effort is all the same for both the teacher and the student, why not learn the Rubik's Cube in such a way so that we can, with casual effort, solve the cube in two minutes? How can we, solve, how can we learn to solve the cube so that we don't get stuck at five minutes? And how do we learn to solve the cube so that if we're really passionate and we decide to invest more time, that we can get really fast with as little effort as possible? To answer this question, uh, I wanted to look at the top solvers. And let's say, for the sake of this conversation, uh, the top solvers will be people who solve the cube in under 20 seconds. And if you went to Polytechnic High School, you had an alum named Shitaro Makisumi, who is awesome. But <laughs> <laughs> he graduated, I think, uh, five years ago. So um, what do these top solvers have in common? Uh, first, I would say about 90 to 95% of these people are solving the cube using something called the Friedrich method. Um, also, these people, they all pretty much turn the cube really quickly, about three to five turns per second. So let's examine the first point. Uh, what is the Friedrich method? The Friedrich method is the most popular advanced speed solving method in the world today. Uh, first, you solve a cross on one side. Then you're going to solve two layers of the cube. I like that clicking sound. It's kind of cool. <laughs> And then after that, we're going to match all the stickers on this last side. And finally, we're going to move the remaining eight pieces into the proper location. <laughs> Thanks. So why, why, <laughs> so why don't students learn the Friedrich method? Well, the problem is to match all the colors on this last side, you actually have to learn 57 different move sequences or algorithms, each which corresponds to a unique pattern. And to remove the last eight pieces into the right position, that's another 21 different algorithms. If I told you you'd have to memorize a whole bunch of stuff and it would take you a month to learn to solve the cube, it'd be a really hard sell. So the Friedrich method is really not practical for beginners. But how can we learn the cube so that we can best utilize the ideas of the Friedrich method? And how can we learn the cube so that if we really want to get fast, if we want to solve the cube in 20 seconds, that we can use everything that we've learned as a building block for that later goal? The way to do this is to actually break the method apart into sub-steps. Um, we can do this. We can actually take the 21 algorithms that you use to move the last eight pieces around and compress it down into only two algorithms. And we do this by considering the, the corners and edges separately. What we've done here is we're using a reduction of the Friedrich method. And actually, the algorithms that we use show up in the Friedrich method if we come up with those cases of just the corners or the edges. The nice part about this is that if we ever decide that we want to get fast, if we ever decide that we want to solve the cube in 20 seconds, we're already now a couple algorithms ahead on that path. I realize that you know, of, people who solved, of people who learn to solve the cube, who go on to solve the cube in 20 seconds, it's a very small percentage. But if the effort is all the same, why not learn it this way? What about turning speed? How do we learn to turn the cube? Or how do we learn the cube so that we can develop the techniques for turning it really quickly? Um, I'll be honest. When I first learned to solve the cube, um, it was my brother who taught me. And I was solving the cube in kind of the way that I'm going to say not to do it. Um, but this was 10 years ago, and neither of us really knew any better. So <laughs> um, most people who learn to solve the cube, they learn to solve the cube in layers. You learn to solve the top layer first and then you learn to solve the middle layer, and then you solve the bottom layer. Uh, the issue with this is actually that our most agile fingers, which are our index fingers, they have access to the top layer. And when we solve the cube from the top to the bottom, 
Um, a lot of these algorithms require us to turn the bottom layer, so it's really not that friendly. We can actually fix this pretty easily. Um, you just turn the cube over. <laughs> and now when we solve the cube from the bottom to the middle to the top, um, you know, now the cube is ergonomically friendly in our hands. And we can learn the same algorithms as the top solvers, and we can actually begin to build the same techniques that the top solvers use to turn the cube very quickly. Again, if the effort's all the same, why not learn it this way? So, you know, solving cubes is really fun. Um, but what's the big idea? Um, whenever we do an activity or we learn a new skill, it's important to understand what the building blocks are for that skill. We need to know what the building blocks are and have set the foundation so that we can work to build these skills. If you play the violin, those building blocks are going to be things like intonation, playing things in tune, uh, your sound production, and the connection from each note to each note. You're not going to get much better if you just repeat the same passage over and over again. And if you want to race a mile, you're going to have to work on things like your aerobic endurance, your lactate threshold, and your strength. It means you can't just go out every day and run a leisurely three-mile run and expect to have a good race. <laughs> so we have, more, we have access to more information today than we ever have had in the past. And we can learn from the mistakes of others and use that information to best optimize the use of our time and optimize our learning. Thank you.